in, are here in person today. This hearing is a continuation of our efforts to enact a long-term reauthorization of the National Flood Insurance Program. The program's been extended 25 times since 2017. The latest extension will expire on September 30th of this year. We've heard from multiple groups representing the broad scope of stakeholders, realtors, public works officials, business community, floodplain managers, mortgage lenders, FEMA officials across two presidential administrations. They deliver the same basic message. A long-term reauthorization is essential because flooding is the most common and most costly natural disaster facing families, businesses, and communities. Multiple factors are involved. Outdated flood maps, population growth in at-risk areas, land use patterns, overstretched infrastructures, and in, in infrastructure in many areas all play a role. Climate change is only making it worse. It's causing more frequent extreme weather events. It's making rainfall and snowfall less predictable. In recent weeks, we've witnessed the highest river flooding in over 20 years in parts of the upper Mississippi Valley. California, unusually wet weather, has resurrected a lake that's been dry since the 1980s, inundated, inundating pro productive cropland, threatening downstream communities. An extreme rainstorm overwhelmed Fort Lauderdale with over two feet of rainfall. According to NOAA, nearly half the United States is at risk of flooding this spring. All of this hurricane season hasn't even started yet. Flooding is devastating to families and homes and businesses and communities. It's only getting worse, these disasters also often fall hardest on low-income families and communities that have fewer resources to prepare for and to respond to them. We'll hear from one of our witnesses about particular challenges faced by rural communities. We need to help our families and communities to adapt and become more resilient both to the flooding we face now and to the increases we are know, know are coming in the next decades. Whenever possible, we want to help communities avoid extreme flooding altogether through pre-disaster flood mitigation. NFIP is critical that. It provides $1.3 trillion in coverage to 4.7 million homes and businesses in 22,000 communities. There are a number of things that separate NFIP from the private insurance industry. Unlike a private insurance company, the NFIP does not just provide insurance. Its job is to prevent and minimize flood damage in the first place, not just help with recovery. NFIP combats the overall threat of flooding through four related components, flood insurance, floodplain management, floodplain mapping, and mitigation. The bipartisan infrastructure bill provided a down payment on new opportunities for communities to help own home, homeowners by providing additional funding for grants to mitigate homes prior to disaster or to expedite post-disaster buyouts for those who choose to move out of harm's way. We need to build on that investment because of continued denial of the breadth and the scope of the climate crisis by some members of Congress. Unbelievably, a significant number in this Congress continue to deny the science of climate change when the cities and their states are at sea level or below and their forests are on fire. We know flooding will get worse and require even more resources and more aggressive action to prevent. We'll have to reauthorize and strengthen NFIP and invest in flood mitigation and floodplain management before disasters happen in communities. Last Congress, we heard from stakeholders, including practitioners working with communities and families. We learned about barriers to underserved communities and families participating in flood mitigation programs. We learned about the benefits of expanding the community rating system to help communities reduce local flood risk. We learned about the importance of helping communities and proper property owners to understand their risk, both through improving mapping and other risk communications and through disclosure of flood hazards to prospective owners and tenants. And we learned the importance of building state and local capacity to carry out our floodplain management and mitigation programs, especially for small and rural communities of like places, people like, like Montana. We heard FEMA's recommendations for strengthening the program, including forgiving the overhang of debt from previous disasters and providing means-tested assistance to help more families afford insurance. I'm interested in hearing our witnesses' recommendations for ways we can strengthen NFIP so that it can serve all communities, including rural and underserved and tribal communities, and how flood resistance is part of a holistic community policy. It's no secret that NFIP reauthorization has proven to be a challenge. It's complex with multiple goals with implications for many of the things people care about most, their homes and their communities. 
I believe, however, it's possible for us to come together to reauthorize and to improve this program. I look forward to working with Ranking Member Scott and the members of this committee to strengthen FIP and the country's comprehensive approach to mitigating flood risk through a long-term reauthorization uh, bill this Congress. Senator Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for joining us. Appreciate both of the witnesses and the one here with us virtually uh, talking about such an important conversation. I'll certainly say as a lifelong South Carolinian, I understand the real loss and impact that flooding has on our communities because I've lived through them. In 2016, after Hurricane Matthew, I remember the devastation in a small town called Nichols, South Carolina, where the devastation of the storm was hard to watch. I mean, even days after the storm was gone, the water was still above my knees as we looked for ways to help rebuild that community. <clears throat> Just two years later, Hurricane Florence came through the same town, washing away lives, homes, and businesses. Eight people were lost that year in South Carolina due to the storm. When I think about these experiences, the one word that does come to mind is the, the word resiliency. It's really important that our communities are resilient, and I will say without any question, the people of Nichols, South Carolina, and so many of the other hard-hit areas have proven to be resilient people. If the homes and the infrastructure built in these communities had the structural resilience to match the spiritual resilience of these residents, we wouldn't see the same kind of devastation that we do in the wake of major storms like Matthew and Florence. Uh, before coming to Washington, I spent a few years uh, in the insurance business, uh, about 23 of those years in the insurance business, and more than half of that time was selling flood insurance. And I will say my experience goes back to Hurricane Hugo that devastated the Charleston area in a way that very few things ever has. And when you understand and appreciate the necessity of programs that work, you certainly do have an affinity and appreciation for the National Flood Insurance Program and, and its mission of helping out during this, some of the most challenging situations that we see. You couple that with FEMA, you understand as a community starts to rebuild the importance of having a federal program that works. My concern is that when you look at the National Flood Insurance Program, the one thing we have to say is that it hasn't worked the way that it was intended to do. If you look at the fact that in 2017, we canceled $16 billion of its debt, and yet NFIP still owes more than $20 billion to the taxpayers. That, to me, is a problem. And I think we can't just look through the prism of hopefully the federal government shows up when there is a need. At the same time, we have to make sure that the federal government, the programs within the government, are as efficient and, and as effective as humanly possible to meet the broader needs of the people. One of the challenges I've often said is that I was trying to do some basic math there on the back of a piece of paper here, as Chairman Brown was so eloquently speaking. It, 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 three states, Louisiana, South Carolina, and Florida, represent a disproportionate share of the premiums that flow into the National Flood Insurance Program. But when you look at the flood occurrences and incidents around the country, what you'll come to conclude is that flooding is, is impacting communities in Ohio, uh, devastating communities in Iowa, and yet 40% of the premium that funds the program comes from three specific states. That means that the formula that we're using to calculate who should be paying into the system is insufficient and certainly leaves the program underfunded. We have to re-examine the theory in my, my perspective, Mr. Chairman, not just flood insurance, but catastrophic occurrences that are happening more and more across the country. For us to understand and appreciate the necessity of what we're talking about, you can't do it in a silo of just flood insurance. We have to have a broader conversation about our catastrophic occurrences because taxpayers are subsidizing wind activities, tornadoes, and other challenges, as well as flood activities. So when you see it from a panoramic view, you come to a very different understanding and appreciation for the weight of catastrophic occurrences on the American people. Planning for that is something that we have just done poorly because we continue to see 
flood insurance and flood challenges and national flood insurance program as a coastal program and the rest of the interior may not have to worry about it. But the truth of it is that we're seeing so many incredibly expensive incidents in the interior of our country and not simply on our coast. And, and that reinforces the importance of us having this conversation today and thinking about not only where they happen, but where the most vulnerable communities are least prepared to respond to the challenges. Uh, one of the, the areas where I think we could spend more time in disaster management is the area of prevention. That's why I'm reintroducing my bipartisan legislation, the Repeatedly Flooded Communities Preparation Act. This legislation seeks to provide more resources to those areas of our nation that face consistent and continuous flooding. Breaking the costly cycle of repeated flooding and rebuilding is an ounce of prevention, and it certainly is worth a pound of cure. Too often, both our conversations about flooding and the federal spending meant to address its focus is focused on large cities on the coast where the costs and disasters are high. But we can't forget about the small towns and the rural communities far upriver who oftentimes have even higher risks, as I just described a few minutes ago. Most of you are aware of my work on Opportunity Zones, where economic development incentives are targeted to communities who need it most. Recent changes to better target federal mitigation efforts to underserved communities will have similar positive impacts without an actuarially sound insurance program. And that's the challenge of premium insufficiency is it's not actuarially sound because we have not understood the risk as it is as opposed to the way that we think it should be. This program will never be financially solid. Without better mitigation and mapping, costs for the insurance side of the program will continue to grow. That is why comprehensive reform to the NFIP is essential, and doing so is the only way to ensure that flood insurance can remain affordable, accessible, and most importantly, helpful to policyholders when they need it the most. Let me just finish on that one thought there. We look at the FEMA disaster recovery. I think the maximum amount is around $39,000 that people are able to be eligible for, whether you have flood insurance or not. Uh, we, we have to figure out how to make sure that Americans who need the coverage have the coverage, which I believe will reduce the burden that we're putting on the NFIP. Uh, we have to understand the risk as it is. And once again, not as we wish it was. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Scott. Uh, we're joined by stakeholders to share their ideas about ways to improve NFIP and better protect our communities. Dr. Carolyn Kuski serves as Assistant Vice President for Economics and Policy at the Environmental Defense Fund. Before joining EDF, Dr. Kuski was Director of the Wharton Risk Management Decision Processing Center at the University of, of um, Pennsylvania. Mr. Roy White uh, leads the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety. Prior to joining, he served as Chief Executive of National Flood Insurance Program and testified before this committee. Uh, welcome in person, Mr. Wright. Uh, Ms. Patricia Hernandez serves as Executive Director for Headwaters Economics located in Bozeman, Montana. She has practical experience working with rural and undercapacity communities and tribes on flood mitigation grant projects as well as research experience. Uh, welcome, Ms. Hernandez, in person. Uh, we will begin uh, with Dr. Kuski, uh, remote from Philadelphia. Dr. Kuski. Good morning. I'd like to thank Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Scott, and the esteemed members of the committee for the invitation to speak to you today. And I'd also like to thank this committee for their attention to this topic. I'm the Associate Vice President for Economics and Policy at the Environmental Defense Fund and have been researching the NFIP for over 15 years. And that prior work informs my testimony today. I'd like to start by stressing the important role that insurance plays in recovery from disasters. Severe floods impose enormous and variable costs on households, ranging from property damage to evacuation and temporary living expenses to cleaning up debris or buying fuel and generators, the list goes on and on. 
Most households have insufficient liquid savings to cover these expenses outright. Disaster loans are often a first line of defense, but for lower income households, additional debt could make their financial situation more precarious and limited repayment ability often means they're locked out of access to credit altogether. And we know that federal disaster aid is too limited or too delayed or too difficult to navigate. So with limited other options, insurance is essential for financial resilience. In ongoing research, for example, a colleague and I find that after hurricanes, households with insurance are less likely to report high financial burdens and less likely to have unmet funding needs. We also find that widespread uptake of flood insurance improves local economic recovery by increasing visitations to local commercial establishments. And this echoes, echoes other research findings that insurance improves recovery and that lack of flood insurance can actually widen inequality post-disaster. For over 50 years, the NFIP has been providing this necessary coverage for millions of households. But as you know, we still see far too many households at risk not participating in this important financial protection. That's driven by many factors like lack of sufficient public information on flood risk and the cost of flood damages, as well as our own individual optimism that when the sun is shining, disasters won't happen to us. Another key driver is that far too often, those who need insurance the most are simply unable to afford it. But without the resources to recover and obtain safe housing again, households might have to cover the recovery expenses in ways that can have negative impacts for their household or limit their ability to build wealth, like having to defer medical expenses or fall behind on bills or drain retirement savings. And that's why equitable access to affordable insurance is so important. There's now increasing concern about affordability as prices rise to more closely align with risk at a property level. Risk Rating 2.0 made really important reforms to the way the NFIP prices policies, but it did not come with a means-tested affordability program, which would require congressional action. Many researchers and agencies, including FEMA and the National Academy of Sciences, have long advocated for this approach. It should be supported through taxpayer dollars, be scaled so that the amount of support phases out as income increases, and be available to anyone, current or future policyholder, in or out of the SFHA. But I want to stress that the best way to address higher insurance prices is to lower the underlying risk. When risks are lower, insurance and disaster costs are less expensive. Prior investments in risk reduction by FEMA and the NFIP have paid dividends around the country. And right now, as mentioned, there's more mitigation grant funding available than ever before. But while this new funding is substantial, it's actually still far below demand. And as the risk of climate extremes continues to grow, so will the need. In the face of this, the NFIP can keep doing more to support risk reduction. A first step is providing better information on flood risk, today's risk, and risk as the climate changes to households and communities. Before a community permits development or family decides where to live, they should have an understanding of how the frequency of flooding might change, of the magnitude of those floods and their financial implications, of the full cost of insurance today and potential increases in the future. But right now, none of that information is easily available, creating information failures that can lead to risky decisions and information distortions in housing and mortgage markets. The NFIP can also provide greater financial support for risk reduction. This could include greater funding for post-disaster resilient rebuilding, support for community mitigation, including nature-based approaches, a renewed focus on repetitive loss properties, speeding the time it takes to secure buyouts when owners want to relocate post-flood, increasing capacity building and technical, technical assistance to under-resourced communities, and also supporting low-cost flood mitigation options as well. Finally, I want to note that ensuring disasters is difficult. Their catastrophic nature poses challenges to the private sector. And that's why we have so many public disaster insurance programs from the NFIP to the California Earthquake Authority to state wind pools. But these public programs still have to figure out how to cover the cost of catastrophic loss years. The NFIP was never designed to do this, hence why it's now $20.5 billion in debt to the U.S. Treasury. This is a debt that all observers agree cannot be repaid by the program, and policyholders should not be shouldering the million dollars in interest the NFIP owes daily. I'll close by noting that with a suite of reforms and a long-term reauthorization, the NFIP can be put on a sound path to providing financial resilience to households and communities, as well as reducing long-term federal disaster costs as we grapple as a nation with growing climate extremes. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Kuski. Um, Mr. Wright, you're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Brown, Ranking uh, Member Scott, and Senators of the Community. Uh, Community resilience seems to be the raison d'etre of the uh, disaster world. And a decade ago, community resilience was an aspiration. It was frankly more of a talking point. 
With recent investments funded by Congress, the United States has put significant dollars into mitigation programs across the federal government. The question is no longer whether more federal funding is needed, it's how we spend those funds most wisely. As mentioned, urban communities experiencing coastal funding, uh, flooding, make the news quite a bit, but the flooding is national. It is regional in this kind of space. Suburban and rural communities across the nation experience that, yet many lack the expertise and the resources to address the risk or even to seek out the federal aid. We can do better for them. The built environment should be constructed to withstand what we know about the natural perils, especially when we know how to build and mitigate in ways to withstand Mother Nature's fury. The science on flood mitigation is more straightforward than it is for the other perils. Uh, you build higher and stronger, you elevate. You get out of the way of the water, you relocate. Or you redirect the water, drainage and other flood infrastructure projects. While the engineering piece of this is clear, the path to bring these solutions to flood-prone homes and communities is far less clear. Mitigating before an event is always the goal, yet too many homes file repeat flood claims. So I commend FEMA for its Swift Current Initiative that incorporates repetitive loss home acquisitions into the disaster recovery timeframe, yet there is still room to make Swift Current meet the mark as being swift. Make it happen in real time so that the point of insurance claim is the point of grant offer for these repetitive losses. That said, property level mitigation will never be an efficient means to tackle this problem. Parenthetically, I'll say property level mitigation is the right answer for wildfire or for um, wind risk. A single flood elevation or relocation project changes the experience for a single family yet it does not bend down the overall risk curve. Neighborhood scale endeavors are best. Elevate a full block of homes, and the entire neighborhood returns after the water receipts. Buy out a couple blocks of a subdivision to leave room for the water, and the first responders don't need to approach the area during the flood. The water can flow. Neighborhood scale and infrastructure flood mitigation investments do more. You consider what New Orleans uh, during and after Hurricane Ida. While too many homeowners experience devastating and preventable losses from Ida's wind, the flood systems worked, and homes in New Orleans were spared flood damage. A final note on investing in flood resilience, using mitigation grants to reduce risk to existing structures and communities is inherently reactive. Grants help us address previously made choices, both where and how we built our homes and communities, Yet we need to become more proactive in our approach to flood resilience. We cannot keep putting. and attention that the executives are doing a good job. Do you see it the same way? And is there anything we can do to stop that? That's for Mr. Quabman. First off, Senator, you're a small businessman, yep. right? You understand how uh, many of those banks work. And that's why I said, you know, that there was an esoteric model with, with the banks we were talking about here. I do think with the Federal Reserve, um, I think there were several assertions made in the report without the data, which I think is troubling. There were certain assertions made about executive compensation about and that need to do more. Let me just read for you page 75 of the report for a second, one sentence from the report, which contradicts some of what the assertions are, which is why I think your inquiries are going to be even more important. Supervisors' interviews with the comp 
Compensation Committee Chair, SVP, indicated that the Compensation Committee decided not to reduce incentive compensation despite the known uh, weakness of the Enterprise Risk Management Program, fearing this will lead to the increased attrition of senior increased attrition of senior executives due to executives' compensation already being lower than peer firms. So there's already contradictory information even in that report, which I think we need more information on. The, uh, uh, the only thing that I would just say is, is that this board of directors did not do their job. Their executives did not do their job. If they got paid minimum wage, they got overpaid. That's all. Uh, Senator Scott's recognized. John, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, there's no doubt that the figure that we're looking at for the bank execs is un inexcusable, without any question. We, you and I will probably disagree on my next comment, but I will say that an administration that prints and spends trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars, that would be embarrassing to any drunken person with somebody else's credit card, is remarkable. And having the Fed have 10 increases in about a year only exposes the vulnerabilities in a bank that is gambling on lower interest rates when every indication is they're going higher and higher and higher. And yet we don't have conversation about some of the underlying causes of an unstable, chaotic economy that leads to liquidity risks on a different topic. It is no secret that these banks were rife with mismanagement. I've said it myself time and again, and now even the regulators and the reports are confirming this truth. But the use of emergency powers may be just as detrimental to the continuity of our banking system going forward. If the government is always there to intervene and bail out a failing bank, this could promote riskier decisions in the financial sector moving forward. With potential bad actors hedging their bets with the strength of Uncle Sam, how could they lose? And that's not a bet I want to see. Principles of risk management are based around the possibilities of loss. And if we eliminate the reality of failure, there ends up being no cause for prudent management, only a masking of bad decisions waiting to implode, like they did with SVB. Mr. Quadman. Does the increased usage of emergency powers incentivize proper management? And you've already started that answer with John, with, with Senator Tester, without any question. But I th your last comment really struck me, and I wanted you to continue to expound upon this. This, this is a very important question. John and I both run businesses. Uh, and whenever you infuse in any sector the moral hazard that somehow you're just geniuses with no risk because there's no chance of failure, you do incentivize more and more bad behavior and less focus on the underlying issue of prudent management. No, Senator Scott, I, there's a lot to unpack there, but I think you are hitting on the right points of we've had an issue of moral hazard. We've had an extended period of time of zero interest rates where management and governance was not necessarily keeping uh, uh, pace with that. Additionally, regulators are not uh, keeping an eye on things as well. So when we had the cash go up, right, with the spending that was happening, they had to go into bank deposits. Um, there was not a, a sufficient focus on interest rate risk and, and the issues that had to happen there. The other one point I want to raise as well, and Senator Scott, where, you know, as a small business person, regional banks are a very key player for Main Street businesses. They have been prudently um, acting um, and I have not had the same esoteric issues here. Yes. But again, if, if, the cop isn't, if the cop on the beat isn't enforcing the law, new authority isn't going to do much. Amen. That's a good word. Uh, since 2008, the FDIC has filed dozens of lawsuits and entered into nearly 1,000 settlement agreements with officers, directors, and other professionals related to loss suffered by banks placed.
And a bank should trust that it will be safe. They shouldn't have to give it a second thought. That money isn't just sitting in the bank vault collecting dust. Working Americans lend their hard-earned money to their banks with the promise to get it back with a little bit of interest. They expect that their banker will not only keep their money safe, but they'll also take those, cons those cons customer deposits and put them good to good use. That's what many banks do. They make loans to small businesses. They issue mortgages to home buyers. They finance new apartment buildings so that our communities can continue to grow and prosper. This is Banking 101. It's pretty boring, as good banking should be. Because of the important role that banks play in our economy, that responsibility comes with a public safety net. American taxpayers subsidize this industry with government guarantees like deposit insurance and access to emergency loans. These are perks that most Americans don't get. Workers don't have access to special emergency loans when something goes wrong in their lives. Banks get special treatment because they're supposed, supposed to play a special role in our economy. But we've seen over and over and that some bank executives don't hold up their end of the deal. Banks need to manage their risks to build capital to be able to pay back their depositors when they need their money back. That's not what happened at two banks recently, at Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. Their CEOs and executives led their banks off a cliff. They failed to manage the risks associated with their business models and investments. They lack strong corporate governance and internal controls. They failed to respond to, and in some cases ignored, regulators' admonitions and concerns. And we ended up with a bank run. As their banks grew rapidly, more than doubling and tripling in size in just three years, think of that. That doesn't happen very often. Their already weak risk management couldn't keep up one of these two banks and I know there's a third one too, but one of these two banks didn't, he have, didn't even have a chief risk officer. It's the Wall Street business model. We see corporations follow over and over. Executives put short-term profits above everything else. In this case, that meant taking on more and more risk. Fatter profit margins meant higher payouts for those at the top, more risk for the small businesses with their money in the bank. At Silicon Valley Bank, executive bonuses were tied to the bank's return on equity, so they bought securities with higher yields to chase higher and higher profits. When those investments started to lose money, instead of changing course, they doubled down. At Signature Bank, executives had incentive compensation plans that were tied to, that were tied to return on assets to reflect additional focus on profitability. Additional focus on profitability. Just hear those words. Then when the writing was on the wall, SVB executives dumped millions of dollars worth of company stock. At First Republic, Senator, senior executives sold millions in their bank stock less than a week after SVB and Signature Bank failed, and that sparked further concerns at their own bank. For a lot of Americans, this brought a sickening feeling of deja vu. Everyone remembers 2008. We remember Wall Street wrecking our economy, setting off the worst, uh, the worst recession since the Great Depression that cost millions of Americans jobs and homes. Americans will never forget that, by and large, Wall Street executives who caused that pain didn't face consequences. Their profits and bonuses weren't clawed back, they went up. Only in corporate boardrooms can you run your business into the ground, take the economy with you, and still come out ahead. We can't let that happen again. Bank executives who take too much risk, who crash their banks because of their own hubris and greed, shouldn't get to ride off into the sunset with their ill-gotten gains. They shouldn't get to take their bad behavior to another bank where they can continue to profit off an unsustainable business model and put more people's money at risk. When it comes to holding bank executives accountable for their recklessness, the wheels of justice typically move slowly or not at all. We know when workers make one mistake, if they overdraft a bank account or miss a credit card payment, they get dinged with fees and penalties. When big exec bank executives and giant Wall Street firms do something much worse, like run their bank into the ground to crash their whole economy, they're almost never held accountable. The big banks have more money and resources to fight tooth and nail. They have layers of complex management and bureaucracy to shield them. It makes it harder and takes longer to enforce the law. Remember this, just a few days after SBP and signature bank failures, Kerry Tolstead, whom we've certainly um, talked about in this committee, the former, Wall, the former Wells Fargo executive who led the bank's years-long fake account scandal that was uncovered in 2016, was finally banned from the industry and fined $17 million. Only now, a decade later, 
is the executive responsible for the massive scandal that hurt hundreds of thousands of Americans. Going now, a decade later, is, 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 Ms., is Ms. Tolstead care, uh, held to account. We need to strengthen our financial work to watchdog's ability to impose fines to ban bad actors from the banking industry, claw back compensation so that accountability doesn't just apply to the teller who miscounts the cash box or the community bank director who makes a bad judgment on a loan. We must modernize enforcement rules to match the size and complexity of banks with billions of dollars in assets and multiple business lines, banks like Silicon Valley and Wells Fargo. We need legislation to expand the bank agency's authority to ban a bank executive or manager from the industry for failing to properly oversee the bank's operations. We need legislation to make it easier for agencies to bring actions against bank executives and managers who are asleep at the switch so we can disincentivize the, law, the lax oversight that leads to bank failures. We need legislation to clarify and expand the FDIC's authority to claw back compensation. Uh, we, need to, we need legislation to increase penalties and make it easier to impose fines against these bad actors. And we need legislation to require the agencies to finally finish Dodd-Frank Section 956 rule on incentive-based compensation. I've been talking to many of my colleagues about this, including the ranking member. I know there's bipartisan interest on many of these issues. Two of the members on this committee have bipartisan bills. I hope we can work together to get this done. As we've seen over the past few months, we need a system that deters exec excessive risk-taking and imposes real financial consequences on individuals for failing to oversee and manage those risks. Bank executives can't continue to operate under the assumption that basic risk management is optional and always, always, always secondary to making profits. Say that again, bank executives can't operate a bank in a manner where risk management is optional. That's exactly what happened here and is underscored uh, by the reports that regulators and GIO put out last week. Executives failed to manage their banks. Later this month, in closing, I will say we will hear from regulators about what they can do to strengthen their oversight and supervision and how we can make the banks and our financial system more resilient. And then we'll hear directly from the failed bank executives who must answer for their bank's downfalls. But today our focus is on how to improve the tools we have to hold them accountable and prevent those failures from happening in the first place. Ultimately, bank executives are responsible for the success or failure of their institution. They're responsible for keeping depositors' money safe. They know when they sign up for a job that banking is built on trust. They're responsible for holding up their end of the deal. Senator Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today we're supposed to be talking about holding executives accountable after recent bank failures. But from where I sit, all I see is finger pointing. I don't see anyone from the bank executives to the regulators to the Biden administration taking meaningful accountability for their actions that played a role in the recent bank failures. We should 100% discuss certain authorities regulators have to claw back executives' compensation if that individual acted in malpractice. And we should discuss the lack of accountability at the executive and board of director level as well but we should not forget that the regulators should also be held accountable. So like I've said from the beginning, this was a failure in three parts, and we must discuss accountability across the board for bank executives, bank regulators, and this administration's inflationary spending policies. And I look forward to addressing these issues later in hearings this month. As for the bank executives, these were not your average banks. They were like the Las Vegas betting tables of banks that rolled the dice on falling interest rates when everything pointed in exactly the opposite direction. And if that didn't have the red alert sirens going, we now know that they suffered rampant mismanagement and these very same risks that brought the banks down were in plain sight to the supervisors flashing red lights without a question. What a blatant disregard for economic conditions, a disregard for supervisory warnings, and a disregard for basic corporate governance and risk controls. To start, SVB operated without a chief risk officer for eight months following the resignation of the previous officer in April of 2022. A very fast-growing bank, unprecedented growth, 
without a risk officer for eight consecutive months. But even more concerning is when Silicon Valley Bank failed, it had 31 open supervisory findings, and that level of findings is about three times the number of other peer banks. As a Charlestonian, I'm going to put it a different way. We are known for amazing restaurants and fantastic food. If one of our restaurants had 31 safety or health violations, they would be shut down in a heartbeat. We wouldn't get to 31. But what's more, if an inspector failed to take note of those 31 safety or health issues in the first place, they would lose all credibility and their jobs. Regulators must also be held accountable for their supervisory failures to the same extent that the failed bank execs and the directors should be. Otherwise, there is no incentive for anyone at fault to change. Just last week, we received the Federal Reserve and FDIC's report on the failures of SVB and Signature Bank. The Federal Reserve report acknowledged the supervisors did not fully appreciate the extent of the vulnerabilities as SVB as it grew in size and complexity. But rather than focusing on these failures and providing mechanisms to ensure sufficient steps are taken in the future, the Federal Reserve used the report as a scapegoat to push its progressive regulatory agenda. Where is the accountability for the inaction on the Federal Reserve? I think we should all keep in mind that the last time Michael Barr testified before the committee, he would not commit to firing any of the employees who failed to do their jobs. The FDIC's report also found supervisory failures as well as failures in bank management. Additionally, after the failure of a second California bank, First Republic, with over $200 billion in assets over the past weekend, it is clear that the practices and the standards of the California state supervisors also merit congressional scrutiny. Turning back to the bank executives, we must find a path forward to holding bad actors accountable. We all know that market behavior is a driving force and perhaps we should look to strengthening corporate responsibility through good governance mechanisms. For example, it has been reported that SVB's bonuses came with so-called clawback provisions that would allow the lender to recoup, recoup the pay if there was wrongdoing. However, th there was no provision allowing the bank to claw back the money if excessive risk-taking led to the losses. I certainly think this is something we can and should discuss. At the same time, if good governance reforms are not appropriately targeted and calibrated, an overly prescriptive approach has the, pot has the potential to further siphon and divert talent away from the banking sector to non-bank sectors of the financial services industry. As we have seen here, good management is absolutely essential. Recruiting talented uh, folks at financial institutions is of the utmost importance in making sure that these institutions run smoothly and soundly. It is questionable whether we should be encouraging supervisors to dedicate more time, attention, and manpower to evaluating the risk, riskiness of compensation practices when they have failed to resolve bread and butter banking practices at these failed banks. The FDIC, the SEC, and the DOJ have authorities to hold management at these failed banks accountable for any misconduct. At the end of the day, the United States banking system is one of the most heavily regulated industries in the world. What is the point of having law after regulation, after rule, after guidance, if the regulators aren't using the tools they already have at their disposal? It doesn't matter what we do in Congress if the regulators don't implement and enforce the laws we create as intended. With that, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses and on accountability across the board with existing authorities and any potential suggestions you may have. 
Uh, thank you, Senator Scott. Um, I just, before introducing the, the witnesses, I just came from a meeting with the CEO of, of, East, of, of Norfolk Southern. Uh, and I think most of you know the, the terrible train tragedy, the derailing in, in East Palestine. And uh, I, one of the comments I've made about this is we know that uh, when that happened, when Silicon Valley Bank happened, first thing I thought of was East Palestine because of the, in the history of our country, the last hundred years, the most powerful two interest groups in this country are the banks and the railroads. And I know we often hear about all these rules and all these regulations on banks, but we also know this town swarms with bank lobbyists so often getting their way and weakening those rules and intimidating regulators, and we know all that. So um, I'll introduce the witnesses. Da Lin is an assistant professor of law at the University of Richmond. Her scholarship focus on financial regulation, securities regulation, and corporate governance. Ms. Lin, nice to see you. Thanks for coming. Thomas Quadman is executive vice president of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Center for Capital Markets, Competitiveness, Chamber Technology Engagement Center, and the Global Innovation Policy Center. Mr. Quadman, welcome. Glad you're here. Um, Ms. Heidi Schooner is a professor of law at the Columbus School of Law, the Catholic University of America. Her scholarship focuses on the regulation of the financial services industry. Welcome back to the committee. Nice to see you again. Um, Ms. Professor Lynn, you start, please. Thank you, Senator. Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Scott, and members of the Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you. My name is Da Lin. I am an associate professor of law at the University of Richmond School of Law, where I study and teach corporate governance, financial regulation, and securities regulation. I would also like to thank my supporters' family, who are here with me today, my husband Parth, and our ever-curious toddler, Oliver. Federal banking regulators have broad authority to remove bankers from office for engaging in deceptive, unsafe, or unsound practices, and even to permanently prohibit them from working in the banking industry. Unfortunately, this authority has rarely been used against bank directors and senior executives, even when their mismanagement results in bank failure. I will briefly explain the current statutory landscape and then discuss potential reforms to strengthen bank oversight and governance. Under current law, federal banking regulators may permanently bar any employee of a bank from working in the banking industry under the following circumstances. If an individual, one, participated in misconduct, including violations of law, breaches of fiduciary duties, and unsafe or unsound practices. Two, the misconduct harmed the bank or benefited the wrongdoer. And three, the misconduct involved personal dishonesty or demonstrated willful or continuing disregard for the safety or soundness of the institution. Over the past 20 years, America's largest banks have settled hundreds of major lawsuits and paid over $195 billion in fines and penalties. They have admitted to pervasive fraud, bribery, money laundering, price fixing, illegal kickbacks, discriminatory lending, and a host of other consumer protection violations. Yet, federal banking regulators have barred senior management of only one major U.S. bank from the industry. Instead, Regulators have primarily excluded rank-and-file workers for low-level misconduct, such as embezzlement, that has little impact on bank safety or administration. In my study of enforcement actions issued by the Federal Reserve between 2015 and 2019, I found that 72% of individuals prohibited from banking were low-level employees who had already been terminated from their jobs. And after the 2008 financial crisis, banking regulators barred 21 rank and file workers, but did not impose a sanction on a single senior executive. This disparity exists because the current law is not well designed to be applied to senior bank leadership, particularly at larger banks. There are two main obstacles. First, the culpability requirement for removal and prohibition is overly demanding, requiring as I have mentioned, personal dishonesty or a willful or continuing disregard for the safety or soundness of the institution. Yet, failed management is seldom a deliberate act, and it is even less likely to be provable as one. Directors and senior executives are typically shielded from knowledge of operational details by the diffuse decision-making processes that characterize most large and mid-sized banks. Second, 
As banks have consolidated and grown over the past 30 years, the role of senior bank leadership has transformed. Their responsibilities consist increasingly of institutional oversight rather than participation in operational details. Today, when senior bankers fail to adequately perform their jobs, it is nearly always because they either neglected known issues or they were uninformed because they did not establish systems, structures, and internal controls designed to effectively detect operational risk. However, the statute underlying the prohibition authority has not been substantively updated since 1989. While the responsibilities of bank leadership are increasingly systemic in character, the requirements that regulators must satisfy to prohibit an individual from the industry remain focused on discrete activities. Congress should recognize mismanagement and institutional oversight failure as a distinct basis for removal and prohibition. I would like to close by observing that the authority to remove individuals from office and prohibit them from working in the banking industry is one of several tools available to federal regulators to hold bankers accountable for unsafe or unsound practices. And I applaud the committee for also considering proposals to broaden this toolkit. I want to emphasize, however, that those other mechanisms cannot replicate or replace a potent removal and prohibition authority in strengthening bank governance. The same bank directors and executives whose mismanagement caused a bank to fail should not be permitted to run your bank. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lynn. Mr. Quadman, welcome. Thank you, Chairman Brown and uh, Ranking Member Scott, members of the committee, for holding this hearing. From the information that is available, it appears that the recent banking turmoil is a result of a failure of supervision, management, and governance. The subject of this hearing today covers three banks out of 4,500 in the United States. It's also important to remember that those three banks had very unique business models. Silicon Valley Bank concentrated on capital-intensive tech startups as well as biomedical startups. First Republic Bank concentrated on wealth management, whereas Signature Bank uh, had a large exposure to digital assets. Those business models are much different than the traditional regional banks uh, that provide financial resources for Main Street businesses. Turning to executive compensation, we have to remember that there is a global marketplace for CEO and executive talent. Compensation is key for acquiring and retaining the talent needed for the long-term success of a business. The Chamber has been on record since 2005 where we've been critical of behavior that drives short-termism, specifically the use of quarterly earnings guidance. Furthermore, if policies do not align with market demands, businesses will suffer. There are multiple checks on compensation, specifically in governance in general. We have investor and board oversight, which comes with it for publicly traded companies, SEC clawback authorities, as well as SAM pay votes. We have the Federal Deposit Insurance Act, which allows for the, comp- for the recoupment of compensation, of which over $4 billion has been recovered. There's a 2010 Joint Bank Regulating Regulator Guidance on Sound Incentive Compensation Policies, which, in our view, fulfills the, uh, the requirements of Section 956 of the Dodd-Frank Act. Additionally, we have the Orderly Liquidation Authority, Clawback Authority as well. This failure of supervision is quite startling. We have MRAs that went back as far as, to, as 2020. There is, in the, FD, in the Federal Reserve report from last Friday, we have seen how there was a lack of communication between management and the board on key issues. Those are red flags that should have been brought to the immediate attention of the regulators and action should have been taken. Furthermore, while the regulators were not taking action, J.P. Morgan Chase issued an investor note in November on the interest rate risk with Silicon Valley Bank. More so, we have to be very careful about how new policies are going to be developed uh, in this area. We sent a letter to the banking regulators, both in terms of of this banking crisis as well as a holistic review on capital requirements that the Federal Reserve and other banking regulators be transparent with the data, share that with stakeholders in order to fulfill the requirements of the Administrative Procedures Act as well as the Regal Act. Furthermore, we have to look at some of the legislation that's before the committee today. The Warren Hawley bill would allow for a five-year clawback of salary and compensation. Who would want to go work for any business that has a five-year clawback of salary? Furthermore, that clawback authority also, go, also extends to professionals such as lawyers and accountants. Which professional firm is going to want to engage in that kind of contract 
and that is going to deprive those businesses of the talent they need to govern themselves. Furthermore, there's a Reed Grassley bill, which we are sympathetic with. However, A, there needs to be more information on it, but let's also not forget that insider trading is already illegal. Heaping more authorities is not necessarily going to mean anything if the cop on the beat isn't doing anything. And finally, let me just close with Credit Suisse, which is a cautionary tale. In 2013, the Swiss uh, passed new uh, compensation policies which prohibited bonuses, restricted salary, and had a binding say and pay vote. Credit Suisse's uh, stock took a hit once that passed and it never recovered. Furthermore, from 2013 moving forward, Credit Suisse has cited those compensation pol policies as an obstacle to their being able to retain and attract talent and actually flagging that as a risk to the long-term health of the bank. We need to keep that in mind because we also know how that ended. Mr. Chairman, thank you and happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Quadman. Uh, Professor Schooner, welcome. Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Scott, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's hearing on the accountability of bank executives. In my testimony, I offer two central observations. First, bank executives play a critical role in maintaining the strength of our financial system, and that role requires a diligence and care that sets them apart from managers of non-bank firms. Second, Congress has recognized the importance of bank executives' responsibilities by authorizing federal bank regulators to hold executives accountable for management failures. Existing law, however, could be reformed to provide stronger accountability for bank executives who act negligently or for the board members who fail in their oversight responsibilities. As the committee well knows, banks are special in the services that they provide and they are also inherently fragile, subject to the kinds of runs that we've seen all too recently. Such characteristics justify extensive regulation of banks' operations, but the responsibility for safety and soundness of the institution ultimately rests with bank management. While managers owe fiduciary duties to their institutions, just like officers and directors of any corporation, their critical responsibilities do not end there. Bank executives are responsible for managing inherently risky institutions that are critical to sustaining the health of the economy and thus the well-being of all citizens. We're res they are responsible for institutions that rely on taxpayer uh, backing in the form of deposit insurance and uh, emergency liquidity. Recent events amply illustrate the extent of this dependence. Bank management is a heavy responsibility indeed. In the United States and around the world, the importance of management to bank safety and soundness is recognized from cradle to grave. Law and regulation expressly demand competent management from the institution's initial chartering to the supervision of the bank's ongoing operations and through to the resolution of the failed institution. Federal law also imposes liability on bank officers and directors for mismanagement. Recent proposals seek to enhance the banking agency's ability to hold executives accountable for such mis mismanagement. Recent reform proposals seek to impose consequences through clawbacks of executive compensation on bank executives of failed banks. The relevance of this reform became clear when the Federal Reserve released its report last week on the failure of Silicon Valley Bank. The report finds that Silicon Valley Bank's incentive compensation arrangements encouraged excessive short-term risk-taking. Banker compensation should not encourage, let alone reward, excessive risk-taking that leads to significant loss or worse, a bank's failure. Clawbacks, especially mandatory clawbacks, are an appropriate consequence for such mismanagement. Moreover, clawbacks can help maintain or restore the public's confidence in our financial system. While I support the accountability of bank managers of failed banks, I urge that such proposals be considered in conjunction with reforms that would improve the accountability of managers of both failed and open institutions. Uh, strengthening existing administrative enforcement powers applicable to officers and directors of open institutions as well as closed uh, institutions offers two important advantages. First, explicit consequences for negligent behavior and failure of oversight could provide powerful incentives for bank executives to exercise prudence in managing fragile and often complex organizations and thus help prevent needless bank failures and the associated losses. 
Second, strengthening agency enforcement tools would better level the, com the competitive playing field between large and small banks. Given the reality of too big to fail, only managers of relatively smaller banks are impacted by the consequences triggered by a bank's failure. The recent failures of Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, and First Republic Bank highlight the importance of vigilance in maintaining the safety and soundness of our financial system. Bank executives form the frontline defense against bank failure. When bank executives fail in their responsibilities to protect the safety and soundness of their institutions, they should be held accountable to the public. Congress can enhance accountability through reforms aimed at both mismanagement at both failed and open banks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Schooner. We'll, we'll begin the questioning with Senator Tester of Montana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the hospitality, and I want to thank you and the ranking member for holding this hearing, and I want to thank the folks who testified today. So, uh, thank you for all for being here. Uh, it is clear that the management of these banks made poor decisions. They ignored risk factors, ultimately resulted in failure. It's also clear that the regulators weren't dropping the hammer on these banks and the executives or the boards, even when the problems that supervisors had identified were not being addressed. Um, these were problems that the executives knew about, but instead of addressing them, they gave themselves bonuses which should make everybody in this room's blood boil. Regulators and law enforcement must take steps to investigate actions of the former bank management. Those folks responsible must be held accountable to make sure that similar mistakes aren't uh, made again, because if they're not addressed, they will be. Ms. Lynn, where are the gaps in our existing federal structure for holding these executives accountable? Are the laws there, or do we need to put more laws on the books? Thank you, Senator. For the Prohibition and Removal Authority, uh, as it is applied to bank executives and directors, senior bank leadership, there are important gaps that deter effective enforcement, effective use of this authority. The problems, in my opinion, are twofold. First is the culpability requirement, which requires regulators to show either personal dishonesty or a willful or continuing disregard for the safety or soundness of the institution. This demanding requirement broadly insulates directors and officers of large banks from liability or sanction because they can credibly deny knowledge of most operational details. The challenge of proving willful complicity increases as the distance to, to the wrongdoing, the wrong, uh, wrongful activity, uh, increases, especially when the misconduct relates to complex issues such as risk management. So is, do you have recommendations on what this committee could do to make, uh, uh, to address those gaps? Yes, Senator. Okay, would love to get them. Uh, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna move on because I only got five minutes. Ms. Schooner, uh, Professor Schooner, I should say, do, do you believe those gaps are there, and do you have recommendations if there, if you believe there are gaps that you could give this committee, give myself, the chairman, ranking member? Mike. Senator, I, uh, I agree with Professor Lynn that uh, the standards for administrative enforcement yep. are unduly high, uh, requiring reckless, uh, showing of reckless conduct, which especially with larger okay. institutions is problematic. Okay, well, I would, trust me, if you get them to me, I, 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 I would love to see them. Mr. Quammen, are your views on sufficiency of federal regulators, law enforcement tools, um, what, what are your views on that to be able to hold executives accountable? You, you talked about in your opening statement that you thought they were there. Is, is, you stand by those. Yeah, we believe that uh, the authorities were there. We don't believe that the uh, regulators took a, you know, effective action. We are actually looking forward to the hearings that you're going to have here, right. both with those executives as with, as with uh, Vice Chair Barr. And, and if there's information that comes about where maybe our views are going to change a little bit on that, we'll be happy Perfect. to talk with you further. I, I want to clarify a little bit. Uh, I'm not talking about the regulations that the banks are held to, because I think those regulations were there. The regulators had the ability to stop this from happening. They didn't drop the hammer. They did not. I'm talking about the the regulators have the ability to hold the bank executives accountable. So with you, with the specific point that you raised at the, at the start of your question about the bonuses that were paid, yeah. we need the information there because insider trading is, is illegal, right? 10B5 is not a safe harbor. I got you. So... We think that action should be taken. If it was inappropriate activity there, it should be, you know, it should be handled then. So the, the, I'm sure uh, 
and I appreciate that perspective, by the way, Mr. Quadman. I, I am sure that you probably looked at this situation, particularly with Silicon Valley Bank, like we did. I mean, all the signs were there. I mean, all the signs. Why do you think we haven't heard anything about clawing back or holding people accountable? Because I, I haven't heard a word about that. I believe to some degree we're still in the uh, investigatory stage with with the different uh, with the different agencies that are there, okay. um, and it takes a little bit of time. Okay, um, I have one more question, and, and that that deals with uh, um, um, that deals with regulation moving forward. It, you know what? I've run out of time. I'll put it for the record. You were kind enough to let me go first. I do not want to hold up the Thanks, I can. Yeah, go ahead. I'll, you I'll guys yield, are both I'll, pretty. I'll, pretty yield, I'll yield you a minute of the chairman's time. Well, yeah, okay. <laughs> nice story. So one of my concerns about the outcome of this, because the Fed report pointed out that the regulation was there to handle it, that the regulators did not enforce the regulation and hold people accountable. One of my concerns is, is that there will be a push to get more regulation. I think that's going to happen. I don't think it'll happen, but I think there will be a push for it. But my concern is similar to what happened in 2008, that the regulators will respond in a way where they put the screws to the banks who are following the rules, and that the board is paying attention, that the executives are doing a good job. Do you see it the same way? And is there anything we can do to stop that? That's for Mr. Quabman. First off, Senator, you're a small businessman, yep. right? You understand how uh, many of those banks work. And that's why I said, you know, that there was an esoteric model with, with the banks we were talking about here. I do think with the Federal Reserve, um, I think there were several assertions made in the report without the data, which I think is troubling. There were certain assertions made about executive compensation about and that need to do more. Let me just read for you page 75 of the report for a second, one sentence from the report, which contradicts some of what the assertions are, which is why I think your inquiries are going to be even more important. Supervisors' interviews with the Compensation Committee Chair, SVP, indicated that the Compensation Committee decided not to reduce incentive compensation despite the known uh, weakness of the enterprise risk management program. Fearing this will lead to the increased attrition of senior, increased attrition of senior executives due to executives' compensation already being lower than peer firms. So there's already contradictory information even in that report, which I think we need more information on. The, uh, 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 the only thing that I would just say is is that this board of directors did not do their job. Their executives did not do their job. If they got paid minimum wage, they got overpaid. That's all. Uh, Senator Scott's recognized. John, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, there's no doubt that the failure that we're looking at from the bank execs is un inexcusable, without any question. We, you and I will probably disagree on my next comment, but I will say that an administration that prints and spends trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars, that would be embarrassing to any drunken person with somebody else's credit card, is remarkable. And having the Fed have 10 increases in about a year only exposes the vulnerabilities in a bank that is gambling on lower interest rates when every indication is they're going higher and higher and higher. And yet we don't have conversation about some of the underlying causes of an unstable, chaotic economy that leads to liquidity risks. On a different topic, it is no secret that these banks were rife with mismanagement. I've said it myself time and again, and now even the regulators and the reports are confirming this truth. But the use of emergency powers may be just as detrimental to the continuity of our banking system going forward. If the government is always there to intervene and bail out a failing bank, this could promote riskier decisions in the financial sector moving forward. With potential bad actors hedging their bets with the strength of Uncle Sam, how could they lose? And that's not a bet I want to see. Principles of risk management are based around the possibilities of loss. And if we eliminate the reality of failure, there ends up being no cause for prudent management, only a masking of bad decisions waiting to implode like they did with SVB. Mr. Quadman, does the increased usage of emergency powers incentivize proper management? And you've already started that answer with John, with, with Senator Tester, without any question. But I th your last comment really struck me, and I wanted you to continue to expound upon this. This, this, this is a very important question. John and I both 
run businesses. Uh, and whenever you infuse in any sector the moral hazard that somehow you're just geniuses with no risk because there's no chance of failure, you do incentivize more and more bad behavior and less focus on the underlying issue of prudent management. No, Senator Scott, I, there's a lot to unpack there, but I think you are hitting on the right points of we've had an issue of moral hazard. We've had an extended period of time of zero interest rates where management and governance was not necessarily keeping uh, uh, pace with that. Additionally, regulators are not uh, keeping an eye on things as well. So when we had the cash go up, right, with the spending that was happening, they had to go into bank deposits. Um, there was not a, a sufficient focus on interest rate risk and, and the issues that had to happen there. The other one point I want to raise as well, and Senator Scott, where, you know, as a small business person, regional banks are a very key player for Main Street businesses. They have been prudently um, acting um, and I have not had the same esoteric issues here. Yes. But again, if if the cop is in, if the cop on the beat isn't enforcing the law, new authority isn't going to do much. Amen. That's a good word. Uh, since 2008, the FDIC has filed dozens of lawsuits and entered into nearly 1,000 settlement agreements with officers, directors, and other professionals related to the loss suffered by banks placed in FDIC receivership. Such actions have led to recoveries totaling more than four billion dollars. The FDIC has stated that it generally brings personal liability cases against the officers and directors of failed banks when there are these instances, dishonest conduct, inappropriate transactions with bank insiders, failure to establish, follow, or monitor sound underwriting policies and procedures, and failure to respond to concerns raised by regulators, accountants, counsel, or other professionals. Is there any reason to doubt that the FDIC has existing authority to hold senior leadership and, and directors personally liable? No, we think the authorities are there. Um, and clearly you cite the statistics that show that. Um, additionally, the, the Fed and other banking regulators have those authorities as well. But is, what is clear, even from the rudimentary information that we have with SVP and the other banks, is that sufficient action was not taken. And some of these issues in, in terms of, you know, one of where management is not communicating problems to the board of directors, that's a red flag that should have been jumped on immediately and wasn't. Yeah, two tools that work in your toolbox that you don't use doesn't mean you need a third one. Correct. Thank you. Reed. Uh, thanks, Senator Scott. Um, first question to all three of you, and please just answer yes or no. It's pretty straightforward. Do you agree that individual executives whose mismanagement and disregard for basic banking principles that led to the failure of these banks should face meaning, meaningful consequences for their action. Professor Lynn? Yes. Mr. Quadman? Yes, if the information shows that. Okay. Yes. Professor, thank you. It's clear, and this is for you, Professor Schooner, it's clear that in the case of SBB and Signature, bank executives failed to properly oversee and manage the risk of their institutions. Their compensation was tied to profits, which incentivized them to grow their banks. And the SVB was almost unprecedented in the speed at which it grew. Uh, they also rewarded themselves with bonuses in the weeks and months leading up to their failure, even when regulators were raising red flag after red flag after red flag about risks at that bank. Do we need to deter this type of information um, by individual executives ahead of time so we can avoid a potential failure that put customers, the banking system, and ultimately taxpayers at risk? Yes, Senator. I think that we need to focus on the ongoing operations of banks in a safe and sound manner, and we shouldn't send the signal to uh, bank executives that when the bank fails, they can walk away, and that's it. Uh, I think that's the wrong kind of incentive. So we need to encourage uh, uh, prudent operations and management while banks are operating. Thank you. Professor Lynn, you've found that bank executives are rarely barred from the industry when they've engaged in mismanagement or poor supervision. Why is, is the existing removal power not suited for the executives of big banks like SVB and Signature? Thank you, Senator. Uh, there are two obstacles. Uh, the first 
is the culpability requirement, which currently is demanding. It requires personal dishonesty or a willful or continuing disregard for the safety and soundness of the institution. And especially in larger banks, the challenge of proving willful complexity is uh, increases as to the distance of the wrongdoing. Executives today are shielded from liability because of the diffuse decision-making structure that exists in most large and mid-sized institutions. Second, there is a mismatch between the responsibilities of bank executives and directors, which focus on systemic oversight, placing, uh, putting into place uh, systems, internal controls, structures that promptly detect and efficiently deter uh, operational risks, and the focus of the current authority to prohibit uh, bankers from the industry, which narrowly focuses on uh, discrete activities and whether or not there was knowledge of and participation in discrete uh, act, uh, wrongdoing. So I have two recommendations. The first is to adjust the culpability requirement, lowering it to perhaps uh, recklessness or negligence. Uh, and the second is to identify mismanagement and oversight failure as a discrete basis for removal and prohibition from the industry. Thank you. Um, last question, um, Ms. Schooner. Unlike many other countries that only have a handful of mega banks, uh, the U.S. banking system has thousands of small banks that serve local communities. How would strengthening our enforcement tools to hold bank executives accountable not only help prevent failures, but also improve fairness and competition between large and small banks? So, Senator, the reality is that most uh, administrative enforcement actions are brought against uh, the managers of failed institutions. And since megabanks don't fail, that means that they escape that kind of accountability. So I think uh, uh, reforming the administrative enforcement power that agencies currently have to better reach the managers of operating institutions would help level that playing field. And I think all of us were concerned about um, the, you know, the GSEBs that seem to get larger and larger, even those that have not performed um, particularly well. Wells Fargo is always the one that jumps to mind. That all of those banks got bigger with migration of deposits after the, the after SVB and SVB and Signature deposits were moving to those big banks, including Wells Fargo, to tens and tens of billions of dollars, and then. Than what happened just this week with um, FDIC choosing uh, under whatever decision making that was done, choosing JP Morgan Chase. Uh, Senator Vance from Ohio is recognized. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank, thanks to Senator, uh, Senators Brown and, and Scott for hosting this important hearing. Um, you know, I, I'm working with some of my colleagues on some legislation related to clawbacks. And so I'm going to focus my line of questioning just on some very specific applications of how those how those potential statutes might work in practice. Um, in, in in particular, what we're worried about uh, is you know you take a situation like Silicon Valley Bank where executives paid themselves out very large amounts of money in the weeks and months leading up to the failure. And what's especially sick about this, of course, is the taxpayers end up bearing a lot of the risk of those failed decision making um, of that failed decision making, I should say. And the executives end up running away like bandits. And that strikes me as an especially unfair way to run a banking system where you can screw things up, pay yourself out fat bonuses, and then taxpayers end up dealing with the downside risk. Uh, so so I, I, two particular questions that have sort of come up in the conversations I've had with colleagues about this, sort of how to narrowly tailor this such that you're targeting the bank executives who caused these problems and not, let's say, an administrative assistant or a bank teller who had no decision-making authority and what ultimately led to the bank's collapse, whether that's Silicon Valley Bank or somebody else. So th this first question is going to, to, to Mr. Quadman. Um, and, and, and the question here is, can you, can you explain – who gets caught up in the statutory definition of a quote institution affiliated party? Um, you know, what, could that potentially capture a bank teller, an administrative assistant to an executive? Sort of how broad does that sweep? Because that influences how we draft this thing. It actually um, it's extremely broad. You can also be talking about um, an, an accounting firm or a law firm that is providing services to uh, that banking institution as well. So, of course, you know, lawyers and accountants are also extremely important for management and governance purposes. Um, so it, firms would be reluctant to engage with a business if that provision was there. 
And that, again, goes towards the talent issues and management issues. So uh, that is an issue of particular concern that we have. Great. Okay. That, that, that's, that's helpful to know um, and, and certainly a good knowledge for us to have. So, um, Ms. Sh- Sorry. Professor Schooner, uh, wanted to, to sort of direct this, this question to you. So, so one of the things that's, that's sort of come up again on this, this question of narrowing is, um, is, is the question of directors and whether they should be liable under some of these clawback provisions. And you know, I, I know from my time in the private sector that director usually means a member of the board of directors, but sometimes it could be a director of marketing or director of business development. So, so particularly that, that word, if, if you were to expose directors to clawback liability, do you think that could be reasonably interpreted by a court or a regulator to cover mid-level managers who have the director title? Or do you think that would understandably by, by most be applied only to a member of the board of directors? Uh, Senator, I think it would only be applied to uh, the member of the board of directors. I've never seen that term uh, used in a statute used to apply to anybody other than the board. In other words, the the term director is really taken from the incorporation of the of the entity, and the uh, the responsible managers are the board of directors. So I would be very surprised if it was interpreted that way. Got it. Uh, I would love to get the that answer to that question from from Mr. Quadman and Ms. Lynn. Um, in, in reviewing some of the uh, legislation announcements around it regarding the Warren Hawley bill, I think some of it could be, I, I agree in terms of the director issue, but I think some of the uh, definitions could in- include uh, line employees as well, which I don't believe is the intent. I think it's more trying to be direct around senior executives and um, and others where traditionally these compensation issues are more more aligned. We have other concerns with the legislation, but we do think it could be overbroad. What, what, what is it that you think that could apply to, to line employees? I think it's how it, I think it's how it's defined. Okay, um, because there's speci- if you look at other compensation statutes, there are specific levels that are defined as to uh, where um, where entities uh, as to who it, who it applies to. Got it. Okay, Mr. Lynn. I I agree with Professor Schooner, Senator, that directors are typically used to refer to the board of directors. And in fact, in several provisions, for example, in 1818E5, the term directors and officers are specifically defined in a way that also enumerates activities such as substantial participation. And so uh, the focus of the statute um, and the aim of the statute has been always to deter, I use the term directors to mean boards of directors. Got it. Okay. Thank you all. Appreciate it. I yield. Thanks, Senator Reed. Senator Reed of Rhode Island is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, panel, for being here today. Uh, With Senator Grassley, I've introduced S1181. It's the Bank Management Accountability Act. And our legislation would authorize the FDIC to claw back two years of compensation from directors and senior executives of failed systematically important banks and ban them from the financial industry. And I frankly do. I think the American public is just appalled that they're looking at CEOs of Silicon Valley Bank getting $10 million, walking out with even more in terms of stock, and nothing can be done. Uh, Professor Schooner, how would depositors, regulators in the bank industry, and the American people all benefit if Congress were to strengthen FDIC's outdated and weak authorities for ensuring accountability and uh, systematically in systematically important banks? So, Senator, I think you made an important point about the public's confidence in our financial system. I think that without clawback authority, uh, particularly in the circumstances we're just living through, I think really that confidence in the financial system might be reasonably shaken. I think that uh, reforms that would allow for that kind of accountability would not only impact the aftermath of a bank failure, but I also think it would impact the ongoing operations of a bank because bank directors and officers are quite aware of, highly aware of their responsibilities, and I think that they would adjust their behavior accordingly. And uh, Professor Lynn, do you have any comments? I fully agree with uh, Professor Schooner that when banks are held accountable to the public through uh, regulators, enhanced regulators' authority, uh, those authorities seek to uh, 
incentivize bank directors to operate not in shareholders' interests, but also in the public's interests as well. We encourage them not to just focus on making the most profit on wealth maximization, but also taking steps to assure safety and soundness. And so by strengthening uh, enforcement authorities that regulators can use against bank officers uh, and directors, senior bank management, we strengthen their incentives to put the public's interests in mind. So I think both of you have... Uh, two conclusions. One, it would uh, enhance the confidence of the American public in the uh, accountability and the uh, uh, dedication to their interests by bank executives. And second, it would be a, a constant reminder to, uh, to, to behave appropriately uh, by the directors. And in both cases, would enhance the overall uh, stability of the financial system. Is that fair? Yes, ma'am. First. Yes, Senator, I agree. I think it would have both of those effects. Thank you very much. Uh, the uh, other aspect is that I think probably has been touched upon, but you know, our whole society, the world society, is now uh, supercharged by virtual connectivity. Uh, and are there any quick sort of uh, thoughts you have about how the regulators deal with that? This is not Jimmy Stewart. Uh, standing in the lobby telling five people, don't worry, don't worry. It's instantaneously thousands of people being saying, get out, get out, get out of the bank now. Right. I, Senator, I do think the complexity both at uh, the bank operations level and uh, in regulation is a problem. Uh, in the wake of the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, there was a lot of talk about uh, creating uh, regulatory rules that were simpler, that could be applied more uh, broadly, and I think we've sort of gone in the opposite direction. Regulation has become more and more complicated, and I think that makes it difficult for supervisors to apply those standards. Um, and so I think that uh, we could improve the system by improving, by uh, dealing with the complexity of the institutions as well as uh, regulation. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thanks, Senator Reed. Uh, Senator Brett of Alabama is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate all of you being here. Uh, Professor Lynn, I'll have to say, as someone who went back to law school with essentially a newborn and an 11-month-old, um, it particularly warms my heart to see Oliver here with you today. Thank you, Senator. I want to start by saying I am proud uh, from being from a state where financial institutions are really strong. While Alabamians every day continue to face the daily impacts of inflation and economic uncertainty that I believe have been caused by the Biden administration's failed policies, I am proud of the work our regional banks, community banks, and our credit unions have continued to play to instill confidence in Alabama and to support our communities. Regarding the recent failures of Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, and more recently First Republic, I continue to be concerned with regulators' blatant failure to utilize their current authorities ahead of these events. And I believe that recent reports from the Federal Reserve, FDIC, and GAO even further spotlight these failures. I look forward to having the regulators back to testify later this month and provide more definitive answers to this committee following their fact-finding exercises. On today's topic, I certainly agree with my colleagues that bad actors at any institution must be held accountable. In this particular case, it's clear that there were significant mismanagement and risk controls at both SVB and Signature um, that just went awry. And I believe any individual that knowingly contributed to or unjustly profited from the bank's failure and ultimate downfall should absolutely be held responsible. I want to discuss potential legislation, but before we do that, I think it's very important not to be duplicative. So very quickly, if we can just go across, and I will start with you, Professor Schooner. Um, you mentioned existing law. If we can very tightly talk about what law is on the books currently that could be used to, held, to hold these bad actors accountable. The bank regulators have uh, administrative enforcement authority to um, bring actions in a multiple different ways. Um, the, the the standards of culpability are high, though, and so that's where I think that there could be some reform uh, in those laws. Thank you, Mr. Quidden. Senator Britt, um, you know, 
if you take a look at the existing authorities that banking regulators have, that the Department of Justice has, we do uh, SEC has, we do believe that those authorities um, can hold those people accountable. Um, and, and we think that, that um, it is important. That's why I raised the Credit Suisse art, uh, issue of if we put things out of balance, mm-hmm. it's actually going to make our banking system weaker. And mm-hmm. We don't want to go down that road. Okay, let's talk a little. Let's actually drill down on that. How do you feel like there could be something that would be narrowly tailored um, that would not do that? Because the problem is you want to make sure that you are holding bad actors accountable, but not um, being overly broad and clawed backs so deters talent from entering this industry. You all have said, obviously, the banking industry is so critical um, to making sure that this country continues to thrive in the way it does. And so we need the best and brightest going into the banking sector. So can you drill down on, on a narrowly tailored um, solution to that? One of the reasons why I think that the upcoming hearings are so important is that we have the bank saying to the regulators, SVB saying to the banking regulator, our comp packages are not, uh, you know, are not, are, are below where our peers are. Mm-hmm. But then there's all these governance issues that then the, the supervisors are flagging, but they're not doing anything on. So I think it's more looking at what, what broke down within the regulatory structure that needs to be done. Because it, that's why I said with Mr. Scott's uh, questioning, of if the cop on the beat is not enforcing the law, new laws aren't going to do anything. Correct, correct. Um, And Professor Lin. Thank you, Senator. I also agree that the... The current uh, structure has enforcement tools at a regulatory uh, this, uh, at regulators' disposal, but their hands are tied. And what would you high use if I made thing. you right now try to hold these men and women un- accountable who unjustly or enriched themselves? What would you use? There are three main tools. One is the removal and prohibition authority, which bars the bankers from the industry. Okay. The second could be a civil money penalty order, which has been uh, used against executives, and third would be a personal cease and desist order, which could. Uh, Ref, uh, halt certain activities and ask bankers to refrain from certain activities, identifiable activities in the future. Okay, and those are all on the books right now. That's what you would use. But Excellent. their culpability standards make it difficult for our regulators to use, exec- especially against senior leadership at large banks. Okay, I am I'm out of time, but I certainly believe we need to hold these people accountable, um, but make sure that that's narrowly tailored to address the issue at hand. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Brett. Senator Fetterman of Pennsylvania is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hi, I just like to keep everything simple here. So this is a question for really all three of you. So really, what do you think is the reason of the collapses? And why was it incompetency? Was it greed or was it virtuous risk? You guys. I think mismanagement was the primary cause. And incompetency? Just yes. Okay. okay. I think there was mismanagement. There were also supervisory failures that did not allow for appropriate governance to take place. Really? So, so you don't believe that they, there's, they, were, they were just incompetence? No, I, I think that there were issues in terms of with Silicon Valley Bank where they did not have a chief risk officer for a long period of time. They had a long transition with their chief financial officer, which created management issues. Um, but then where the supervisors were actually flagging some of these issues, they never took any follow-up action, which could have prevented the collapse from happening. So, is- Senator, I believe that it was mismanagement specifically that the leadership pursued a rapid, unrestrained growth without appreciating or adequately controlling the increasing risks that the banks faced. M- mismanagement. Was that really no cl- clouded by greed? Or just, just incomp- they're just, you know, they, were they just incompetent? You know, like I thought these were high achieving, you know, executives and, and successful uh, banks. And, you know, were they, do you think they could, it wasn't, had, it wasn't greed or, or did they not, do you think, do they think theoretically that they're like, we can really crash really good because they're going to come cleaning up our mess here kind of a thing? Because that, that to me is, it, it, what do you what do you think? Like, because um, I don't think an average human 
being, uh, you know, in our nation, you know, wouldn't just say, hey, you know what, I'm going to run up too much debt, I'm going to be go come by bankruptcy, being I'm going to get paid it off, kind of a thing. So, like, so do you do you do you think anything that's not part of it? This idea that that, that we, you know we're going to clean up my mess. Uh, Senator, I believe that mismanagement is the problem, but you're talking about the motives for mismanagement. And I think that uh, what the Fed report suggests yeah. is that the motives were short-term uh, gains that were tied to compensation. In fact, I think it was one of the most uh, startling findings in the Federal Reserve's report. It's, Senator, first off, we look forward to the upcoming hearing that you're going to have with the CEOs of these banks to get more information to better understand that. But again, there was a failure of board oversight. There was a failure of management in making appropriate decisions. There was a failure of the supervisors to actually oversee this. Um, and interestingly enough, we had investors such as J.P. Morgan Chase issuing an investor note with Silicon Valley Bank in November, yet there was no action taken by the, the supervisors. So I think there's a lot of blame to, to, to go around here. Senator, I think that the incentives are twofold, at least to the mismanagement. Uh, two, first, there is the problem of Compens uh, compensation, which drives incentives towards sh short-term gains. Second, as the reports reveal, there is the problem of growing banks, that the management, uh, perhaps as a matter of, uh, uh, which could be characterized as incompetence, did not grow with the size of the banks. Uh, so, and that led to incompetence uh, in the performance of the duties. Yeah, yeah personally, just, I, mean, I just find it a hard time believing that, that they don't believe that that these banks realize that someone's going to come in and comes, you know, there to save me. And, and I think they figure that it's just uh, the, the, the kind of uh, risk is, is they're, they're, they're not, they're, they, they know that because they're not going to be to, to, uh, to, to be held accountable and they're going to be made whole. And, and I just find that your average American would be, I find that outrageous. So, anyway, uh, th thank you. Thanks, Senator Fetterman. Uh, Senator, uh, Senator Warner is uh, recognized from his office. Senator Warner of Virginia. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate you holding this hearing. Um, I agree with that things were going awry, and the fact that nobody acted on those um, is is extraordinarily problematic. I also appreciate the fact that you've got Professor Dahlin uh, from University of Richmond, another great uh, uh, law school, another great Virginia pro uh, uh, person on, on this panel, and I've, I've listened in on some of her comments. Um, as you know, Mr. Chairman, I've, I've uh, along with a lot of other members, co-sponsored all of the legislation out there on um, the ability to, to claw back uh, provisions from management who um, uh, are irresponsible, who make these kind of uh, mistakes. Um, I do know and I appreciate the fact that that uh, you know we need to to move on some of this legislation and look forward to a, a markup taking place uh, soon. And particularly when we, we're seeing what may be follow on of SVB and first signature, you know, the dislocation that's taking place in the regional bank markets today. Uh, you know, we are seeing uh, what appears to be close to a meltdown. And a lot of this not due to maybe necessarily bad management practices, uh, but um, the potential for contagion that's taking taking place. But making sure we've got rules in place for clawbacks, making sure that our, the regulators move forward on the um, uh, on the executive compensation issues um, is something that uh, I, I know other colleagues have mentioned as well. I guess my one question for the whole panel will be about the role of boards of directors. I, I just didn't... didn't answering Senator Fetterman's questions about board responsibilities. Um, I think too often bank boards have been viewed as a, a nice perk to have, um, but with that ought to be greater level of responsibility. I know, Professor Stoner, that you've, you've talked about this, but could the whole panel give us some guidance on uh, what policy recommendations we should put in place to make sure that um, uh, bank board, all board responsibilities, but bank board responsibilities in particular are taken in a more serious vein 
uh, both incentive wise and potentially penalty wise, if, if bank boards, as in the case of SVB, um, don't take the the do their take their actions responsible. So I'd ask the whole panel to rush then. Thank you for that question, Senator. And as a Virginia native, I'm happy to take this particular question from you. Uh, so uh, the the boards of directors, the functioning of the board of directors is different from the uh, executive suite in that boards are responsible for overseeing operations and making sure that risk, man risk management procedures are in place. Um, that can lead to unsafe and unsound banking practices, but our current administrative uh, enforcement laws could be amended to make clearer that that oversight function is the standard by which directors are held. Uh, Senator, but Even on that level, wouldn't a, the absence in the case of SVB of not having a chief, chief risk officer for eight months uh, when the bank was experiencing this kind of growth, wouldn't that have been a board responsibility to hold management accountable? Absolutely. Senator, I, I was just going to say, as with any public company, board, the board is an ex extremely important part of the oversight function and governance of, of the company. As you just cited, the lack of a chief risk officer was a board issue. The lengthy transition of the CFO was a board issue. What is also concerning coming out of the uh, Federal Reserve Report, which I think we need more information on, is also how management was not reporting to uh, the board information that they should have had, where the board should have taken action on as well. So we're looking forward for more of the information coming out of your hearings to better understand where those failures were and, it, and what action, if any, should be taken. Thank you. Senator, the, the enforcement actions that are currently at the regulator's disposal do not take into account oversight responsibilities clearly uh, as a basis for 40 actions. So for example, in Wells Fargo, Wells Fargo had implemented, according to a report, better tools and systems to detect employees who did not meet their sales goals than it did to catch employees who engaged in sales practices misconduct. This is a problem of board oversight. They did not implement the proper structures, systems, and internal controls. Yet, for a prohibition action, the regulators are asked to train their eyes solely on the wrongful activity, the sales, who knew and who engaged in the sales misconduct themselves, rather than what structures were in place, what board failures there were. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Senator uh, Warner. Uh, Senator Tillis of North Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I was just, uh, I've been watching the hearing when I've had opportunity to in my office, and Senator Fetterman asked a question of all three of you. Uh, and he had to do with what the root cause was of the bank failure. Uh, Ms. Daylin, did I pronounce that right? Yes, Senator. You said it was management. I agree. Uh, Mr. Quadman, you said it was management and supervision. I agree. Uh, Ms. Schooner, you said management. Uh, why did the two of you not mention any uh, uh, skepticism around the level of supervision and that being a potential root cause. And uh, the chief risk officer is, is an obvious one, I agree. That was a miss of management. I think uh, the CEO not understanding its liquidity threats and its in, internal liquidity stress testing results that he had to have some indication of before he dumped stock. And this is also something who was a class A director on the board of directors who lost his job um, the day that the failure was identified. Why wouldn't the fact that three matters uh, requiring attention and three matters requiring immediate attention, what we don't know yet and we hope to uh, find out in the report is whether or not any of those MRAs become MRIs. Why didn't management act on that and why didn't the supervisory function press the accelerator on getting a response and resolution to that? Um, it, it just seems to me on its face that I could get into more details, but it just seems to me on its face, anybody that's looking at this to not stipulate that it was both a breakdown in executive management and every single dime that we can claw back from anybody in the C-suite, we should, and I do believe that there are devices to, uh, to do that now that we should act on. But why wouldn't that be a part of your observation of some of the factors that likely led to, the uh, led to it? Not to mention 
the overall portfolio, if, if you take a look at Silicon Valley Bank, we, we have other banks that are now getting caught up uh, by its depositors thinking, well, maybe they were like Silicon Valley Bank. There are only a handful of banks that have the kind of risk portfolio that SVB had. So, uh, Ms. Daylin, why wouldn't you have mentioned supervision as a part of the root causes behind the belt, uh, or a, a, a supervision lapse as one of the potential root causes? I have the same question for you, Ms. Schooner. Thank you, Senator. I do think that we found out two uh, important causes of the, uh, of the, uh, the recent bank failures from the reports that were released last week. Uh, first, senior leadership was pursued or incentivized to pursue short-term uh, growth. Yeah. I'm talking more about the risk. supervisory question. But yes, also we learned that regulators missed obvious problems and they were slow to address the problems they did recognize and manage. Oh, okay, and they were, so I, I don't want to interrupt you, but I don't want to be the last person. Oh, well, S Senator Warren's here, so I won't be the last person. Um, so, so it was not that you don't think that uh, there's clearly some questions to be answered there in response to Senator Fetterman's question. You just didn't go down that path in, in your response. You said it was a failure of management. But, but you also understand there are questions that have to be asked on the supervisory function? Yes, Senator. I, the reports... Yeah. Uh, uh, that, that's, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I hate the five-minute limit, but it's there for a reason. Ms. Schooner? I answered Senator Fetterman's question because I interpreted it as asking me what the primary cause of the okay. failure was, and I see it as a management failure. I agree with you that regulatory forbearance is a persistent problem in our system, yeah. um, but I also think that it's very important to keep in mind uh, a finding about Silicon Valley Bank, which was, I found alarming, that the... Um, management was relying on bank regulators yep. to help them manage their interest rate risk, and that is backwards. I agree. I think there's one more layer to the supervisory discussion where I know I disagree with some of my colleagues who didn't support Senate Bill 2155, uh, but we did not stipulate that regulatory, there, there, there are escalation options because we said that they may be able to take a given bank based on its activities and the risks that a supervisor perceives and uh, subject them to a uh, uh, regulatory regimen that we don't think is necessary for other banks with very different uh, portfolios. Uh, so I also want to know why the supervisor chose not to do that, particularly if that supervisor had six outstanding MRAs or MRIAs. Uh, that, to me, uh, leads me to believe that we may find out uh, if we have an objective assessment, if there was equal weight in that. CEOs were incompetent. You need to claw back as much of their compensation as possible. Maybe the supervisory function of the Fed uh, in uh, San Francisco uh, could have equal weight and why that failed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Senator Charles. Senator uh, Warren from Massachusetts is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So in its postmortem of the Silicon Valley bank collapse, the Fed found that legislation passed out of this committee in 2018 led to weakened rules for big banks that were major contributors to SVB's failure. The lessons, I think, are clear. Regulators need to strengthen bank oversight, and Congress must reinstate stronger rules. And here's a place to start. SVB, Signature Bank, and First Republic all lobbied Congress to weaken the guardrails, preventing them from making risky bets with depositors' money. And then, surprise, surprise, these executives took risks to boost their short-term profits, gave themselves huge salaries and bonuses and stock options, and when they crashed their banks, they walked away with fortunes. That's why Senators Cortez Masto, Senator Hawley, Senator Braun, and I introduced a bipartisan bill to ensure that when executives crash their banks and threaten the banking system, those executives are forced to give up their fancy compensation packages. Professor Lin, you are an expert on corporate governance and financial regulation. If our failed bank executives clawback act, which applies to failed banks, no matter how they are dealt with by the FDIC, had been the law of the land when SVB failed, would it have applied to SVB executives? Yes, I believe so, Senator. Uh-huh. And would it have applied to signature executives? I believe so, Senator. And would it have applied to First Republic executives? 
I believe so. All right. SVB, Signature, and First Republic were resolved by the FDIC through different processes using different statutory authorities. To make clawbacks effective, we have to give regulators broad authority to claw back executive pay whenever banks collapse, regardless of the specific process that the FDIC uses to pick up the pieces. Now, unsurprisingly, bank executives hate clawbacks. They want to keep on taking risks with zero consequences. Professor Lin, if our banking regulators had to have the choice whether or not to claw back executive compensation after a bank failure, would you expect Wall Street to exert significant pressure on them not to use that authority? Yes, I think that's a real possibility. You know, it is clear that giving regulators power to do something is not always enough. Congress needs to force regulators to use it, which is what Senators Cortez Masto, Hawley, and Bronze and my bill does. Now, in its review of the SVB collapse, the Government Accountability Office found that, quote, in the five years prior to 2023, regulators identified concerns with Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, but both banks were slow to mitigate the problems the regulators identified and risk built up over time. Professor Schooner, if regulators had had the authority they needed to claw back compensation from SVB executives, would it be reasonable, in your view, for them to consider the executives' actions and pay since 2018 when the regulators first began warning a SVB about its risky practices? Senator, I think that would be very reasonable. Um, uh, incentive arrangements often rely on short-term metrics that uh, it takes the long term to determine whether those involve excessive risk. So I think giving regulators the opportunity to capture that kind of excessive risk-taking is reasonable. Okay. That's very helpful. Thank you. You know, Congress needs to put in place tough rules that make sure that executives pay up when their actions lead directly to a bank failure. And in order for us to do that, the regulation needs to do three things. Force regulators to claw back compensation from the executives who are responsible for the failure. Second, apply in all cases of bank failure, no matter how the particular form comes out. And third, allow up to five years of compensation to be clawed back. My bill with Senators Cortez Masto, Hawley, and Braun achieves all three of those, and I hope that this committee will take action on it soon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Cortez Masto, I understand, is um, joining us from her office from Nevada. She's not. Uh, we'll wrap up if they. Oh, they say they're on their way. Well, I'll just make a closing statement because they're not here. Um, bottom line is bank executives are responsible for these failures. They need to be accountable. I agree with Ranking Member Scott that if this bank were a restaurant with 31 safety violations, it should be shut down, but it, it would not be shut down if the chief health inspector is telling the inspectors to go easy on the restaurant because keeping people safe is just as important. That's what former Vice Chair Quarles said um, after he weakened the rules at the Fed, what he said, that's why we need to strengthen regulatory guardrails. Uh, thanks for our witnesses today for their testimony. Senators who wish to submit questions, for the record, these questions are due one week from today, Thursday, May 11th. To the witnesses, please submit your responses to the questions, for the record, 45 days from the day you receive them. Uh, the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>